Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 6th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets, Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaska for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, some good news. Well, as good as it gets in the current environment on oil prices. Second, a recent op-ed by Senators Hughes, Costello, and Representative Prax on oil taxes badly puts the cart before the horse. We put them back in the correct order. And third, why what happens in D.C. this month will have a big impact on Alaska's economy this fall. And now, let's join Michael. Let's get started and uh, and kick things off right. We're going to talk about maybe some good news with the... Uh, with the oil, uh, with the oil prices. Yeah, I get accused enough of uh, of always using these segments to talk about bad things. So there's there's an opportunity to talk about a <laughs> relatively speaking a good thing. So I thought I would uh, I thought I would take that. Sure, hit us with it. Uh, daily, uh, we post uh, daily except Sundays. We post a a pricing chart that looks at how A and S is doing not only currently but uh, in the futures market, what it looks like uh, through the end of the of the fiscal year. And on July one, we rolled to a new fiscal year. We're now in fiscal year twenty one. Sort of put put the baggage of uh, uh, fiscal year uh, twenty behind us, and have started looking at what fiscal year twenty one looks like. Fiscal year twenty one, the spring revenue forecast for fiscal year twenty one uh, has uh, thirty seven dollars a barrel and about four hundred ninety thousand uh, barrels a day uh, of production. And so far, uh, production's back up. Uh, Conoco has restored production that they had curtailed um, in uh, in May, had been curtailed by uh, 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 Alyeska in May, and Conoco had curtailed in June. They've 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 stopped those curtailments. Production's back up, uh, and prices uh, are are strengthening. Um, now it's it's as a result of OPEC taking so much production off of the market. Uh, that they've essentially reduced supply to to equal demand uh, to help strengthen prices, but prices prices are strengthening. The the FY21 budget, uh, as I said, is based on $37 a barrel so far uh, uh, this year. Just a few days in July, we're at, we're in the 40s. But what's even more important in looking at these things is looking at the futures market uh, and what that translates into over the course of the fir- of the fiscal year. Uh, and right now, the futures market is averaging, uh, looking like for the year, uh, is going to average around the $44 uh, range if you just took futures as they are, as they've been for the last uh, last several days. That $7 difference between um, uh, what the projection is, assuming assuming production holds up, but that $7 difference between what the uh, what the uh, spring revenue forecast had and the $44 that the futures market would tell us. Uh, tell us right now we're headed for is about $210 million uh, of additional revenue above above the spring forecast. At these price levels, each dollar is about $30 million uh, in additional revenue. So that $7 difference translates into about $210 million. Now, you know, the, 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 the not as perfect news is we're facing a two plus billion dollar deficit. So, uh, that 210 million dollars sort of sort of pales uh, in comparison by the deficit it, it compared to the deficit uh, uh, that we're that we're trying to offset or we're trying trying to make up. But 
I mean, it's not the it's not the ten dollar, twenty dollar uh, on one day in April, the negative dollar uh, oil price uh, that we were seeing uh, at the tail end of uh, fiscal year twenty. So, we're 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 running ahead of the game uh, in terms of oil revenues, not nearly enough to even come close to offsetting the deficit, but we're running ahead of the game. We're not running behind the game. Um, and I think that's, you know, every once in a while you got to stop and, and smell the roses and sort of stop and look at, uh, at really where we are. And, uh, and, and frankly, that's, that's a, that's a, that's a, uh, uh, a better than forecasted, uh, position for us to be in right now. What do you think this means for the long term uh, aspect of oil pricing now? I mean, of course there's no, nothing set in stone, but does this mean that maybe some of the previous, uh, you know, kind of doom and gloom pricing may be a little bit, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a little bit, uh, I've forgotten my words, but, you know, a little bit glo- glo- glum, a little gloomy, that maybe it's going to be a little better than expected, you know, sooner rather than later? Well, it, this is entirely driven by OPEC. So it sort of depends, sort of depends on what uh, OPEC does. Um, OPEC's kept a huge amount uh, of production off the market. And, and for maybe the first time in their history, they've been very disciplined uh, in how they do it, how, how they've done it. There's been a little leakage from a couple of countries, but, but frankly, Saudi and Russia have offset that, uh, and, and, they've, and, and overall OPEC's been very disciplined. Their goal is, um, uh, their stated goal is to get to $50 a barrel, um, and the market is showing some resistance to that, uh, going to $50 a barrel, um, and so we may not, we may not quite, uh, we may not get there. But but what's really going to be the the test is as we get into the fall, uh, whether OPEC stays with this discipline, or uh, or whether they uh, start backing off uh, the discipline and let uh, and let you know some leakage of additional barrels get back on the market. That's that's also it also depends on what happens to U.S. shale. Does does the prospect of staying in the forty dollar range? Uh, maybe touching the $50 range, uh, does that bring additional shale barrels uh, back onto the market? And if it does, uh, does that drive up supply to the point where prices start collapsing again, or prices start to start falling again? I think we're going to see prices, you know, based upon what, what uh, uh, has been the general consensus of views as we've gone through this, I think we're going to see prices – in the bounce in the $35 to $45 range, we're going to see uh, uh, prices touch 45, and then sort of market resistance sort of set in, set in on that on that uh, at that level, and maybe as shale sort of you know some shale producers come back on, uh, maybe see some uh, some softening in that, uh, but I don't think we're going to plunge back it down into the 20s and into the teens, um, and in the $35 to $45 range, we're going to stay. Uh, above, uh, I think, in above where we where the spring uh, revenue projection is. So, it, it's it's not going to be it's not going to be worse than the spring projection, uh, and I think we're going to err on the high side of the spring projection. The the question is uh, uh, perhaps how much higher we go, and how long does it last based on what else other factors in the market. So, a couple hundred million uh, to the pu- plus that still leaves us with what about a one point eight billion dollar hole. Uh, which we're going to have to fill, uh, which I'm sure we're going to spend a lot of time over the next uh, few weeks uh, discussing and going over. But that leads us uh, from the good news uh, on to the, I don't know, is it bad news or is it just kind of mediocre news? Is it more smoke and mirrors? Number two, uh, the opinion piece by Hughes, Costello, and Prax, uh, you say, uh, although it's titled Saving the PFD, actually does not uh, does not go into that kind of that direction in your opinion. Tell us why. Well, this is this is the the an article or a, or an op-ed by the three of them, Senator Hughes, Senator Hughes, Costello, and uh, Representative Prax, that argues that uh, uh, voting no on Proposition One, voting no on the old tax initiative, is important to saving the PFD, and and basically the theory is, and 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 in this regard, I agree with them. Basically, the theory is uh, raising taxes. Uh, on on oil will decrease investment 
uh, that we receive and will, as a result of decreasing investment, will decrease future production. But where I, where I really have a problem with their argument is, is, is how it relates to the PFD. I mean, what they're saying is, is, is continued investment, future increased or higher future production than where we would be under, uh, under uh, uh, adopting the oil tax initiative. That, that additional future production translates into a higher PFD. We've got to save the PFD first. I mean, we're, we're on track to eliminate the PFD. And saving the PFD means substitute revenues. I mean, we're, we're not going to close this budget gap uh, by, by cutting costs, cutting uh, state spending 50%. So we've got, to save, we've got to save the PFD first. And saving the PFD means substitute revenues. If, if Senator Hughes, Costello, and Representative Prax were, were really focused on the PFD, they would have offered an alternative – they should have offered an alternative revenue – uh, to to the the one they're dissing, uh, which is increased oil revenues. They should have said we're going to save the PFD now, but through through additional revenues, through substitute revenues, and then we're going to save the PFD long term by ensuring that there's continued oil investment and uh, and continued oil revenues. Uh, what they're what they're essentially saying is what what they're essentially arguing is let's not adopt. The, 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 the substitute revenue approach that some propose, which is oil tax initiatives, but then they're silent about what alternative substitute revenue approach uh, we ought to have, um, and, then, and then argue that, that, we ought to, that, 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 that not adopting this substitute revenue approach that some, that some propose, the, the, the oil tax initiative, will somehow save the PFD. So you've got to save the PFD first. Uh, you've got to save the PFD through some form of substitute revenue before you can argue about about the oil tax initiative, uh, voting no on the oil tax initiative, saving saving the PFD uh, long term. They're skipping a huge step, which is to save the PFD uh, out of the box. And I think I think that's a I think that's a real problem uh, with the argument they're making. You know, in, in all honesty, we we need we need substitute revenues. And if no one else is going to propose, come forward. No other political leaders are going to are going to step forward with with proposed substitute revenues to to truly save the PFD to, to substitute revenues for for PFD revenues. If no one else is going to step forward with that, the all tax initiative is the only thing we've got right. to save the PFD. You, so you used... so we so so we need to do that first before we get into arguments about the all tax initiative. You uh, you used in in one of your posts about this. You used the like a hashtag, not this but that kind of thing. Uh, that you know that they have to if they're going to complain about one thing or if they're going to criticize the one thing that they have to offer some kind of alternative. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, if if it's not this, if it's not going to be this 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 uh, oil tax initiative to provide the substitute revenues, then it's got to be something else. And for them to argue against the the, the, the proposed uh, uh, oil tax initiative as a as a revenue source, without uh, without offering a, an alternative uh, substitute revenue source, is just um, it, 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 it's it's a failed argument because we never we, we never get to we never get to the to the PFD long term uh, uh, for the oil tax initiative to have any impact on it. The PFD is gone by then, so it's it's. I mean, it, it's just a huge hole. They're getting they're getting the cart way before the horse. The cart the cart that they're arguing about is the oil tax initiative, but the horse is back. The horse of the PFD is back here saying, "Hey, I need fed. I need to be I need to be survived. Uh, I need to be uh, uh, restored, um, uh, maintained before I ever get in front of the cart. Right. Uh, uh, deal with deal with the horse first." Then you can deal with the cart, but but they just try to skip over that and go straight to the cart, and it's a, and 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 it's a very, very disturbing argument for me, because it means that at least these legislators are willing to skip skip over, uh, saving the PFD and argue in favor of, of the the uh, voting against the oil tax initiative, really without 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 doing their homework first, without saving the PFD first. Well, and that, I think isn't that been most of your criticism uh, as of late is that there's many politicians who talk about these kind of things uh, kind of amorphously or in, in the broad picture, but they never break it down into, OK, so you're going to you're going to save the PFD. You're going to 
but we're still going to have this hole. So how are you going to fill the hole? I mean, that's been kind of your mantra uh, lately. And I don't think anybody's really coming up with, uh, you know, some details. I mean, again, the amorphous, well, we're just cut our way to success kind of thing. Uh, but when you're talking about 50% of the budget, there has not been anything laid on the table that is uh, realistic, I guess, palatable, realistic. Well, there's, there's really, there's, I mean, nobody's even has even come up with 2.2, 2.27, which is the FY22 number, 2.27 billion in uh, in spending cuts, which is what you'd have to do to to match traditional revenues plus the amount remaining of the POMV after taking the statutory PFD. There's nobody's come up with with 2.27 you know, billion in um, in spending cuts. It's it's all been. It's all been. We'll worry about that later. We, we've I've had that. I mean, you, we've had that since 2013. We, we've had. We'll worry about it later, and we've ridden we've ridden this horse uh, by relying on savings. Well, savings are gone. <laughs> so so you know, continuing to say we'll get there, we'll get there. Don't worry about it. We'll find places to save. Um, it, 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 they're, they're just out of credibility on that. Right. Absolutely. I mean, Gov- Governor Dunleavy tried it with a billion dollars uh, with his billion dollar cuts and. In 2019, that failed. We're just we're, we're, there, there's no credibility behind the we'll get there. Don't worry about it. We'll get the spending cuts done. Christine says that's not actually an honest conversation about the oil tax initiative. It will kill the oil industry as we know it. It won't save the PFD, which I think is what Brad was saying, Christine. That uh, you know, cart before the horse specifically. That you know, the oil industry. You know, it will kill the oil industry, but it's not going to save the PFD because that's really. You know, you got them backwards there in that regard, and I think that's what Brad was trying to say. Brad, am I wrong? Is that you were kind of what you were trying to say? No, at first it won't kill the oil industry. It will. I mean, we're we're going to continue to have production. Nobody's going to you know undo the wells and take them out of the ground. We've got sunk investment that will continue to that will continue to produce. We will be on a faster faster decline curve uh, if we uh, pass the initiative because there won't be. Uh, as much investment going forward uh, as there has been, but it's not going to kill uh, the oil re- industry. There will be a period of years where, frankly, we won't be able to tell that much of a difference in terms of in terms of production levels until the until the declines the, uh, the declines kick in. Um, it, but but here's here's the deal. I mean, we, we the most important thing to me, uh, and and ICER's report uh, backs this up. The most important thing. Is to is to preserve the PFD that has the largest positive economic impact uh, on the state. It has the largest positive for Alaska families, um, and and we need to we need to save the PFD, or else Alaska is going to be a much different state economically going forward than than it than it has been. It's going to be a much more um, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Separated state in terms of in terms of the income brackets, the the, the middle and lower income brackets will have will have much less will have a significantly less amount of money, uh, and they'll be in much in a much different state than than the upper income brackets. So we need to save the PFD. That's that's job one, um, and if and, and so we need to find substitute more equitable revenues uh, to deal with that. If if we don't have that. Uh, frankly, uh, the oil tax initiative isn't that bad a thing to do. Uh, it is. It, it will have an impact on oil investment, but it will continue to generate revenues uh, that will continue to uh, 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 support state government and 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 as a result of providing revenues to state government, uh, lessen the the desire to to tax the PFD. If if we get to this situation in November where no one is really proposing uh, a, a good uh, alternative to, to to how we're going to save the PFD, if we get to the situation in November, I'm probably going to be a vote yes uh, on one because it's important to find alternative revenues, substitute revenues, uh, to avoid continued uh, continued PFD cuts. Um, so it's. It, it's not a false conversation. It's not a. It's not a dishonest conversation. It's a. It's a very straightforward conversation. There has to be substitute revenues. If we're not going to cut, and we're not, there has to be substitute revenues to replace the reliance on PFD cuts that the, that the legislatures, the legislatures come to. And if and if we're not going to find another source of those substitute revenues, 
then then additional oil revenues uh, is is as good as it's going to get, and that's what we're going to need to do. Now, frankly, what 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 that would trigger is a subsequent legislative look at what have we done to the oil taxes, and now we need to straighten out the oil taxes. But hopefully, in that process, we would also straighten out, uh, uh, find a subs- an alternative substitute revenue source for for PFD cuts, and straighten out that that issue as well. But that, right. I mean, the, the honest the honest discussion here is we need to find substitute revenues to reduce the the level of PFD cuts that that the legislature has now has now come to. And and when you look at the at the budgets going forward, the projected budgets going forward what they're going to continue to do. We need to find substitute revenues to, to replace that. That's job number one. we got about uh, 90 seconds here. Kevin asked a good question. There does not seem to be the tax base in Alaska due to the small further shrinking population to support an income tax. Why do you think it's a viable idea quickly here? Well, there, there is there is an income base. I mean, that's we, we've got taxes. PFD cuts are taxes. We're taking it out of the population now. The question is whether we take continue to take it out of middle and lower income Alaska families which is what we're doing through PFD cuts, or we take it broadly out of all Alaska families on an equitable basis. There, there is, I mean, the, the, the PFD cuts prove that there's a tax base. Brad misses the children. The children who get the PFD do not earn an income, so the removal of the PFD money does not demonstrate a tax base at all. A tax base depends on earners. Most income in Alaska is earned from government, both federal and state. There's not a big enough income base to generate the taxes we need to fix our deficit, says Kevin. No, that's wrong. That's wrong. There's $25 billion of adjusted gross income in the state of Alaska, including the, including the portion earned here by, uh, by non-residents. The children, the children, you know, the PFD is high enough. The children has that, that income has to be reported on their parents' uh, uh, income tax returns. There's $25 billion, and 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 we're taking, you know, we're taking a a significant share, 1.1.5 billion uh, in PFD cuts. We're taking that. Uh, out of that 25 billion, that 25 billion includes PFD income. So, it, the problem is, it's just coming out of middle and lower income Alaska families. Uh, the question is whether we can we can we can spread it more fairly uh, across all Alaska families. But but it's I mean we're taking it out of the tax base now. We're taking it out of the out of the economy now. And the question is just how you take it take it out of the economy going forward. Do you do it on a more equitable basis, or do you keep focusing it on taking it out of the hands of middle and lower income Alaska families? Okay. Let me see here. Uh, what else we got? Um, uh, do Are we in debt for the tax credits to the oil companies? I mean, there's still a tax credit debit left. They're being paid on a yearly basis. Uh, I don't know where that lawsuit is, but it is going on somewhere. Uh, yeah, we're, we're still on the hook for, for a little bit less than a billion dollars, the last, yeah. the last numbers I saw, uh, and, it's, and it's pending the outcome of the lawsuit. Right. We're getting into our third of the weekly top three. And uh, we're about to uh, to dive deep on that. And this is more of the national level stuff. This goes back to the question of more federal stimulus. And what happens in D.C. at the end of this month is going to have a big impact on the state level, you say. Uh, why is that, Brad? Give us the give us the, the deal here. Well, the 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 current state of the of the nation right now is that state and local governments are are suffering huge hits as a result of of COVID. Uh, there has been um, uh, uh, substantial amounts of layoffs throughout the throughout the country, even in Alaska, uh, at the local government level. Uh, in in terms of in terms of the impact of uh, of COVID as a result of the reduction in revenues, and there's there's a there's a real press uh, for Congress to address uh, that at the state level. Uh, uh, going forward, that's one aspect of what of what of what's before Congress. Uh, going forward, a lot of uh, there's been a lot of uh, discussion in Alaska about hoping that there is that sort of state level uh, revenue generation or or state level grants uh, that come out of the federal government as a way of softening uh, the deficits that we're going to face going forward. Our hit. Uh, uh, from COVID is really the hit that's happened to oil prices uh, at the state level. Local government level is different because of the impact on on sales taxes. But our hit at the uh, at the state level has been as a result of what COVID done uh, COVID has done to uh, to oil prices. And there's there are several uh, in the in the legislature who have been urging uh, as part of the as part of the federal. Uh, 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 
uh, response to COVID, the next response to COVID, that that there be a, a, a substantial amount that uh, that come to state governments. Uh, in our case, uh, that would help offset the, the the hit we've taken as a result of lower lower oil, oil prices and uh, and offset our def, deficit to, to some degree. But there's there's more at stake also uh, in the next round of uh, federal COVID legislation that that impacts. Uh, Alaska and impact state government. The level of unemployment, uh, supplemental unemployment, emergency unemployment uh, that uh, that Congress included in the earlier COVID legislation has resulted in uh, in in income uh, support uh, for uh, middle and lower income Alaska families. Income support uh, that has uh, uh, helped uh, sustain them. Uh, and help to sustain the economies. Uh, the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget did an analysis a couple of weeks ago that I that, that was that was startling. We've actually had more more personal income uh, as a result of, of of the federal legislation that's, that's gone on thus far. More personal income uh, than we had at post COVID uh, than we had pre COVID. The, the combination there certainly there's been reduced. Uh, em- employment and reduced wages, but layering on the federal uh, the federal uh, grants uh, on top of that has resulted in a higher level, uh, on average, a higher level of personal income across the board nationally uh, than existed uh, than existed pre-COVID. We've been sort of riding that wave uh, through June and July, but that wave uh, comes to an end at the end of July. Right. Uh, and and the supplemental income, the supplemental unemployment, uh, the the grants that we that we had, the twelve hundred dollars that showed up in in a lot of people's uh, bank accounts, all of that uh, sort of comes to an end at the end at the end of July. Um, and and a lot of economists nationally are concerned about as well as economists at the Alaska state level are concerned about what that does uh, when that comes to an end. The hope was, uh, when that limitation was put on it, that that, that would tide us through uh, the the disruptions, the economic disruptions caused by COVID, uh, and that at the end of July the economy would be back up and running, uh, and we would we would just sort of seamlessly pick back up where the economy was, uh, and COVID would have, or the federal legislation, the federal uh, support would have gotten us through the hole. But it doesn't look like that hole. Uh, is going away. Certainly, it's not in Alaska. We haven't had any sort of tourist season uh, at all. Uh, the oil, the, the the hole created by the drop in oil prices, reduced activity, uh, investment activity on the slope, uh, has not gone away. Uh, uh, Conoco hasn't restarted its exploration program, for example, and so that hole uh, still sits out there. Uh, and that's that's that, that's replicated in various ways throughout the throughout the rest of the country. So, so we've been riding this way. We've sort of it's sort of been uh, a false economy, if you will. Well, it has been a false economy in the sense it's been predicated on federal government support right. to sort of get us to the end of July. The, the end of July. Now the question is, as as Congress goes through what it's going to do uh, up to the end of uh, at the by the end of July, as Congress confronts what it's going to do, the question is, are we going to fall off that cliff? With the withdrawal of the federal support and sort of fall down to where the economy is now, uh, the uh, the impaired economy as a result of COVID, or is Congress going to do something by the end of July to, to, if not if not you know maintain the the, the surfing wave at the at, at, at its current height, at least uh, uh, do something that sort of gradually uh, uh, weans us off of it, uh, as opposed to just dropping it dropping it altogether. That's that is going to have those two things: the the the, the, the impact on state government uh, and whether there's supplemental support for state governments, and the impact on additional unemployment uh, and other support uh, for uh, for for uh, middle and lower income Alaska families. Whether that's going to continue is going to have a big impact on Alaska. What well, I mean, what if you had your druthers? I mean, what would you like to see here? This step down approach? You think that is the one that makes the the most sense at the moment to to step it down uh, slowly, or I mean, you know, anything we do obviously adds to the deficit. It's going to create problems in the long run. So, I mean, where where do you think we should go from here? Well, the def- 
the long run deficits are, are definitely a concern. And, and, and uh, some economists, the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget and others, are proposing that in any additional legislation that there be provisions that start dealing with uh, with the, 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 the train wreck that we're going to have in the federal budget uh, once this is over, with the with the accumulation of additional debt once this is over, and and there have been there have been legislative proposals about how to do that in terms of automatic re- reducers uh, that would reduce uh, the amount of federal spending going forward, uh, or uh, other provisions that would that would do uh, uh, do various things to uh, 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 help uh, offset the deficits uh, in in future years. But yeah, I think I think Michael, we're, we are going to have to do a step down approach. Uh, the question is going to be what kind of step down, how, how dramatic the step down is, and that's going to be a fight between the House bill, which has already sort of laid out a marker uh, of the high water uh, as a high water mark of of how much they want to continue and. And, and the inclination of some in the Senate to do nothing, um, but but I think a step down approach uh, uh, as we continue to work out of this economic crisis we're in uh, is the right thing to do. I, th- I think just dropping all of the federal support uh, that we've accumulated or that's been built up to sort of support the economy through this, just dropping it cold and letting the end of July be a, a fall off the fiscal cliff um, and let the you know let the chips were fall, fall where they may. The problem is I think the chips are going to fall hardest on middle and lower income Alaska families from, from a state perspective because we will, without, without federal support at the state level, we're, we're going to be confronting eliminating the PFD uh, or some other heavy tax to, 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 to deal with this. Um, and without uh, continued unemployment and other support, we're going to be uh, dealing with a, a huge drop in, um, in uh, state income levels. Uh, at the at the family level, so I, I think the step down approach is is going to be is going to be the right approach. Let me just say this: um, you know, I've always leery to say, you know, these guys are the ones that meddled in the economy to begin with. Donna Arduin's in the chat room. She says the economic disruptions were caused by elected officials, not by COVID. And to continue to go back to them and say, okay. You can nudge it a little more. Okay, you can nudge it a little more. I'm just, you know, I'm always afraid of the correction, the overcorrection. You know, maybe they do too much. They've made us dependent. Now maybe they make us more dependent or less dependent. And I mean, I just, uh, the whole thing is just such a mess. I don't even know, you know, I don't even know where to where to go with it. Well, the economic disruptions were caused by, uh, one can argue, caused by the shutdowns, which were caused by government or caused by the lack of federal response to covid which has left the left the virus uh, uh, still very strong uh, in the population, and thus, you know, thus adversely affecting the economy. But we are where we are. I mean, the the economy is the the, the virus is still strong. We haven't got the virus under control, um, uh, and the economy is still still down on its uh, down on its back. The Alaska economy, with with tourism being gone and with oil prices uh, being down, and with the with the with the lack of activity. Uh, in terms of in terms of new investment up on the slope, I mean the Alaska economy is down on its back. So we are where we are, and the question is, do we just let it fall off the cliff uh, at the end of July, or do we try to, to try to ramp it down in a way that uh, that uh, that lessens the impact of just falling off the cliff? And I think ramping it down is 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 much the better much the better option. I think we're we're people who are concerned about the federal deficit, as I am. Uh, where, where the folk for their focus needs to be on getting things included in this bill that 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 do the hard work of getting getting the deficit closed um, uh, once once we're past this crisis. Things like the Trust Act, which is a, a proposal by uh, a number of legislators, both Republicans and Democrats, to to create commissions to to deal with the. The problem we have with Social Security and with Medicare and with the Highway Trust Fund running out of money uh, much faster as a result of uh, of, of COVID uh, than than where we've been. I think that's a positive step. The deal, the, the proposal to include automatic stabilizers uh, in the budget, so that when unemployment uh, again drops to a certain level, that that we that we make uh, uh, spending cuts or that we or that we do something about revenues uh, to uh, to to offset to offset the deficit. I think that's where 
the, the firepower of those who are concerned about the federal budget need to be focused to get those sorts of provisions in this bill as a condition of supporting the bill, get those provisions in this bill so that once we're through this, those start kicking in uh, and help and help reduce the deficits. But running after the running after the edge of the cliff at the end of July, just saying, well, here we go, we're going to go back into whatever whatever situation the economy has is, is in at the time. I think it's just a is a is a very dangerous step. All right. Well, uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, AK4SB.com on Facebook. Links at the top of the page. Brad, thank you so much for coming on board and joining us today. As always, it's good to talk with you. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Appreciate you. Appreciate you coming on board and joining us today. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.